Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting of the Portsmouth Port and Industrial Commission for February 22nd, 2022, also known as 2222, <laughs> to order. Roll call, please, sir. Good morning, um, Ms. Fafe, Ms. McSwain. Present. Mr. Parr. Present. Ms. Rogers Garner. Present. Mr. Williams, Mr. Swinson, and Ms. Allen. Present. Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Before you have the minutes from the meeting of January 25th, 2022, you have the opportunity to review them. I'll need a motion for approval. I move to, to, to approve the minutes of January 2022. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Ms. McSwain? Yes. Mr. Farr? Yes. Ms. Rogers Garner? Yes. And Ms. Allen? Yes. The motion is adopted. Thank you. Next, we have our financial report for January 2022. Ms. Barisha. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be going through a higher view of financials and let me know if you need more details or any questions. I'll be happy to answer you. So, the first page should be a balance sheet report, which shows the wealth of EPSC. Not much going on this year. If you see under uh, current current asset, which is cash, it's an increase for $2,558. No changes under assets and go way down. The net position is in this year for three thousand two hundred thirty-two dollars. So it's, this is this was comparative to what's going on, what went on on June 30th, 2021. Here is an income statement. Not as I mentioned, it's not going a lot going on. So the the change during just this year is uh, three thousand two hundred thirty. This is just this year, I think, compared to last year. The next page should be a year to date balance budget report. So the first column is the budget, the second is actual year to date, and what's available. Let me know if you have any questions. Any questions from any of the commissioners? All right, now, thank you so much, Ms. Bush. You're That's fine. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, next on our agenda, old business. What are Virginia update, Mr. Mm -hmm. How are you this morning? Uh, Chairwoman Allen, I'm doing very well. Thank it's you. Good to see you on this 2 2 2 2. Two, two. <laughs> uh, um, to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first, again, I always uh, find it to be a real privilege to. Come before the PPIC and provide you all an update on the activity and the good times and bad times. And we're in obviously at a moment of time where it's a good time. Uh, the port continues to see record growth. Um, I believe uh, last month my colleague Andrew Sinclair was here uh, and was able to share the good news of the fact that our calendar year of 2021 was a record year where we handled 3.5 million 20 foot equivalent units. Uh, that growth has continued uh, here from January and February. We haven't put out our official January numbers yet, but they should be uh, released here quite soon. Uh, but we are seeing, again, volumes at unprecedented levels. Um, it also, I think, is to be noted that with um, these volumes, we're also continuing to see friction in the supply chain. Um, and Virginia is continuing to prove itself as being a solution uh, versus one of these friction points. Um, you know, you go to the store these days, right? And there's still stuff that isn't in stock. So uh, we are doing everything we can, both at Virginia International Gateway here in Portsmouth, as well as at Norfolk International Terminals. Um, some of the changes or adjustments we made, for instance, last week, we, we've had a, a pretty big couple weeks here with some snow events. That's something we obviously operationally don't love. Um, and with that, uh, we've had to extend some gate hours. So I know we've added an hour uh, last week to every day at VIG, which has been very, very helpful. We have Saturday hours too. Again, trying to be responsive to that trucking community. One of our key stakeholders, the primary stakeholders, obviously the motor carrier, and, and making sure that they're able to come in and out of the terminal 
in a fluid uh, form. We also, in February, had just released uh, a report that we commissioned with the College of Women Mary on our economic impact. That's something we do every five years. We kind of do a refresher. And the way those studies work is you kind of have to look back in time. And so the numbers we utilized are tapped into our fiscal year 18 figures. Um, and, and our increases, our impact to the economy, of course, have only gone up since the last time we commissioned that report, which was in FY 2013. So just a couple highlights from that fiscal uh, economic impact study that William & Mary uh, commissioned. Uh, the Port of Virginia uh, supported about over 430,000 jobs in FY18. Uh, that's about $100 billion in spending. That's $27 billion in salaries. And I think something that uh, we add again to the communities is that $2.7 billion in state and local taxes and fees uh, that Port of Virginia activity is helping support. And that's Port of Virginia as it refers to the terminals that we run and operate as the state port authority. Uh, the Virginia Maritime Association also does a economic impact study uh, where they'll sometimes couple together um, all industries. And boy, those numbers are, are magnificent when you take into account just general maritime commercial activity happening here uh, in Hampton Roads. And then uh, finally, you know, we continue to make um, significant uh, progress at PMT as there's been, you know, very large announcements around offshore wind and the development that's going to be taking place there. Um, from a staffing perspective, we've uh, brought on board um, a retired Army Corps of Engineer Colonel uh, who's joined the Port Authority to be our VP of Offshore Wind Development, Pat Hensman. Uh, Pat will be overseeing uh, development and, and those projects there at PMT as it relates to the improvements that are currently underway. Um, Dominion Energy and Siemens Gamesa being the two significant projects that are actively working. Um, as it relates to the Dominion opportunity, um, the Port of Virginia will uh, be managing uh, those improvements um, and, and upfitment to the port. And I uh, will tell you that on the EVA website, because it'll go through the port procurement process, this project, uh, we've already put out a notice to uh, contractors to make them aware that there is uh, going to be coming out shortly um, a request for bid or notice for bid um, for the improvements, uh, the comprehensive package uh, for PMT as it relates to the necessary, I would say, upfitment, because there's obviously a significant uh, weight and load bearing requirement associated with offshore wind. And so uh, we'll be running that project, I would expect, uh, approximation in the month of March, uh, and that, that will open up uh, to the community where we can receive uh, bids uh, for that project with the night with the hope uh, that by the second half of this current calendar year, we would begin construction at Portsmouth Marine Terminal uh, <coughs> to build what is going to be a premier globally recognized offshore wind staging handling facility right here in Portsmouth. And that's, that's really exciting. And that's not lost on anybody in this new industry. They're recognizing that Virginia is leading the way and also going to serve not only our local projects, which are you know, Dominion Energy and potentially Ovid Grid, but it's really the next 10, 15 years, what equates to maybe 100, 110, 115 billion dollars of projects that are in the pipeline. So it's it's a very exciting time, and it's like anything. It, it does take you know takes time to make this stuff happen. It took us a while to structure these agreements with the respective tenants. It's going to take some time for build out, but I think we blink and it's going to be 2024, and we'll see stood up there on the key of Portsmouth Marine Terminal towers that are 600 feet tall being loaded onto a purpose-built offshore wind installation vessel that Dominion Energy is building. I mean, there's going to be just it's going to be a neat skyline adjustment here in 24 months at Portsmouth Marine Terminal. So it's it's really exciting. We haven't by any means slowed down. In fact, we like I said we sped up. We've added to staff, and there's a lot of uh, engineering design and, and that sort of sampling work going on today at Port Marine Terminal in preparation of these projects commencing during the second half of this calendar year. So with that, I'll kind of stop. I'm happy to answer any questions or expand on a particular topic. Does anyone have any questions, Madam, Madam Manager? Oh, I'm just curious in terms of your contracting, do you have any goals around minority and women-owned business participation? Yes, we do. In fact, um, we we mirror the state, but we've actually accelerated. I can get you the actual, yes. yeah, but uh, we, by all means, yes, we do. Um, and we're very proud of our our, our record, um, both at EIG, Virginia National Gateway, and at Norfolk International Terminals on, on the 
the participation from uh, SWAM and um, you know, veteran-owned businesses that participate in those projects. But by all means, that is part of, yes, that is one of those, uh, it's a requirement. Okay. Thank you. And I will just say, I don't have the update um, from my colleague, Thomas Cross, uh, but you know, just for awareness, you know, we have an ask in, in the budget uh, for improvement at Norfolk International Terminals, um, and, and that's a significant, uh, over $250 million uh, one-time budget request. And I think it's faring well, um, and that's something we knew at a point in time we would need the improvement at Norfolk International Terminal on the north end to sort of mirror what the south end looks like today. But with the record volumes that we're seeing and knowing that one of the things we're doing is gaining a lot of business, we want to keep this business. But we also don't want to falter and be a, a point of which there's failure. This is a critical investment that's necessary today. And we've been able to articulate that and demonstrate by our performance operationally that this is a wise investment by the Commonwealth so that we continue to grow the port and obviously grow opportunities for the citizens here in our community. So I just want to put that plug in. More to come. Any other questions? Madam Chair, if I could just uh, add a couple of uh, comments and thoughts on um, Mr. Gullickson's presentation. Um, with the arrival of Orsted and, and Dominion Energy and now Siemens Gamesa at Portsmouth Marine Terminal, we've seen a very significant uptick in interest in other sites here in Portsmouth. Um, related to the offshore wind industry and this brand new industry coming to Hampton Roads, which and we have every intention of Portland being the epicenter for the East Coast, as, as Chris alluded to. Um, so we're seeing some spinoff already um, now that this is an actuality and, and there are things actually happening there at the site. Um, there's been a lot of interest uh, from the supply chain as well as developers in the offshore wind industry. So uh, that is happening. I think you'll see more of that to come. I think it's great news uh, as far as industrial interest and activity goes. Um, I think it, you know, the city as a whole is going to benefit from this uh, industry uh, very much. So just wanted to share that with you, and of course we'll you know keep you informed as uh, we have projects that we are reviewing and entertaining and offering assistance with uh, going forward. We'll make sure that we're keeping you informed. Thank you. Definitely an exciting time for really the state, region, and team. Yeah, and I mean I just if I got one more comment, um, you know thinking about. Um, the port post locality grant to the Department of Housing, and, and I know the last recipient um, of that grant uh, there in Port Norfolk, part of Portsmouth. You know, again, that's a, a company that I think has seen interest as well, an existing business interest in, in wind, and it is something that's going to take uh, improvements, investments, and I know uh, the state's looking at that as well on how they. Can further support some of these waterfront investments, but it's great to see the interest is there and that existing businesses here in Portsmouth um, are being able to realize some of these opportunities to grow their businesses as well. I can add one more thing. And in light of all of the development around the port, it would be helpful um, if we could get together and partner in some of the infrastructure leading up to the port. So mm -hmm. I think by having the port on as a sponsor to some of the ideas the city may have for improvements would strengthen our grant opportunities sure, by all means. so Completely stay yes. tuned right. okay. definitely look forward to that okay any other comments thank you so much for your for your presentation this morning we are now to our ppic incentive program the ad hoc committee update vice chair gardner rogers gardner um mr donahue and his staff Want to present a presentation um, about a proposal for opportunity, <clears throat> incentive opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Um, we have been for some time uh, discussing with the PPIC uh, the ability to provide incentive programs uh, to both new and expanding uh, businesses in the city of Portsmouth. And um, you had task staff, along with the ad hoc committee, uh, which consists of Vice Chair uh, Rogers Garner and Mr. Williams, uh, with uh, working to develop a program and some suggested um, incentive offerings that uh, the PPIC may be able to provide. And uh, we have done just that. So we have met uh, just over three times, I want to say, over the last uh, three to four months. 
and uh, we have been working uh, to uh, create a uh, incentive grant program uh, for your consideration. Um, based on some of the um, background discussions and um, I think desires of the commission, um, we really work to again uh, develop a program to incentivize new and expanding uh, existing businesses in the city. Uh, the focus uh, again is industrial activity uh, with the sectors being uh, maritime, distribution, logistics, offshore wind, and advanced manufacturing being those areas that um, are our targeted industrial sectors here in the city um, and that's really what we focused on. Um, there was a desire to incentivize job creation and that's how we based our approach. Um, so we have again uh, worked to develop the program and we looked at other programs throughout the region to determine what other localities were offering. Uh, we wanted to ensure that our program would be competitive uh, comparable and um, you know have some uh, uh, other things that we could uh, perhaps uh, borrow from uh, some of the adjacent communities that might be uh, worth consideration. Um, so just to run through those very quickly, um, we looked at Chesapeake and they do have an economic development incentive grant uh, program uh, which is based on uh, both capital investment and job creation. Uh, their grant program is discretionary and it pays out over a uh, 10-year period. Um, that program is funded through a citywide uh, cigarette tax that is collected on behalf of economic development and um, contributes to the incentive grant program, Chesapeake. Um, Suffolk does have a program. Um, it does not incentivize job creation. It's really tied to capital investment. And then we also looked at Virginia Beach, which has a program as well. Um, and that does uh, score projects on a varying number of factors, including job creation and capital investment. Um, and that goes for a 30 to, uh, 36 to 48 month period in terms of their incentive payout. Um, so uh, we've looked at all of those. Uh, we've looked at some programs offered through the state. Um, primarily the uh, Virginia Enterprise Zone Job Creation Grant, uh, which is something that uh, companies looking to locate in an enterprise zone in Portsmouth uh, would be eligible for. And um, just to recap that program, um, it is based on the number of net new positions uh, created exceeding four jobs. So uh, you would start at the fifth position and go from there. Um, and those would be over um, a five-year period, again, located within a uh, designated Virginia enterprise, which we have two of here in the city. Uh, the job uh, creation grant awards are determined based on the wages paid um, after the uh, first year of the program. Again, that would be uh, over a five-year period. Uh, there are two different uh, amounts of uh, the grant award. It would start at $500 per grant, uh, eligible position for positions earning at least 175% of the federal minimum wage. And for positions at 200% of the federal minimum wage, they can receive up to $800 uh, per position. Um, and they would cap that at a maximum of 350 positions per year. Um, so that again is the state's program. It's been very successful, it's been utilized um, both in Portsmouth and elsewhere. And um, again, that is based on the federal minimum wage, uh, which is currently $7.25 per hour. There are other existing programs um, in the state. The Virginia Values Veterans Program, or V3, uh, offers companies up to $10,000 with 1,000 awarded for eligible veteran hired. Uh, there are some qualification criteria. Uh, the companies must be a certified B3 company and must employ fewer than 300 employees. And the veterans must be employed full time within five years of discharge and retained at least one year. The Virginia Employment Commission also has the Work Opportunity Tax Credit, and that allows for employers to earn $1,200 to $9,600 on hiring from one of a, a list of targeted groups. Um, including veterans, TANF recipients, SNAP recipients, 
designated community residents, vocational rehab, referral programs, ex-felons, supplemental security income recipients, summer youth employees, and qualified long-term unemployment recipients. So there are additional programs available for job creation throughout the state. So we do have a proposed uh, program and guidelines for your consideration today. Uh, we work to base our program largely on the state's program. Uh, it is um, a robust program that is fairly easy to administer. Um, it is done annually. We do have uh, companies in the city that do take advantage of that program based on their location in the enterprise zone. So we have uh, loosely um, structured our program uh, based on theirs. And um, what we are suggesting for your consideration today is uh, that this program be provided for, again, new and expanding businesses in the city. Uh, we would require a minimum qualified new capital investment of $5 million. So that would be the baseline threshold to qualify. Uh, they would need to be a qualified industrial project within one of those targeted industries. Um, again, maritime, distribution, logistics, offshore wind, and advanced manufacturing are what we're focusing on. The projects must be located within a designated Virginia Enterprise Zone boundary within the city. Um, and those who follow uh, a number of the industrial areas that we are targeting for uh, development. Some of the grant parameters uh, for qualifying businesses would be that the positions, again, uh, would be considered after the fourth, so your fifth job uh, would be eligible for uh, the grant board, uh, not to exceed 100 newly created positions. And these have to be net new jobs. They would need to be permanent full-time positions, earning at least 175% of the Virginia minimum wage, uh, not the federal. We've decided um, as an ad hoc committee and staff that the Virginia minimum wage um, is more comparable to a living wage, and it was suggested that that would be more appropriate uh, to encourage um, higher paying positions here within the city of Portsmouth. Uh, it would also require that health benefits be offered uh, to those positions. Um, these positions could not be transferred from another locality within the state or positions created while a company is simultaneously downsizing elsewhere in the Commonwealth. Uh, this would not include any part-time contract, seasonal uh, lease positions, and so forth. Uh, and again, full-time would be defined as 35 hours a week or three weeks a year. Uh, the grant program could provide a one-time grant award equal to $500 per position for positions earning at least 175% of the Virginia minimum wage and $800 per position for those positions at or above 200% of the Virginia minimum wage. So we have put here on the screen uh, for a few examples of uh, what that would mean in terms of your financial commitment and a potential grant award to a business that would qualify. Uh, we ran both scenarios, which were at the 175% and 200% uh, uh, minimum wage uh, rate. Um, Virginia's minimum wage is currently uh, $11 an hour. That became effective in January of this year. Um, it is worth noting that that wage is set to uh, increase. Um, to $12 in 2023, $13, $15, and ultimately uh, $15 in 2026. Um, so the example we've uh, provided here is based on the current uh, Virginia minimum wage, and it shows you, uh, based on the uh, theoretical number of positions created, uh, what your uh, grant commitment will be. Uh, so just some examples to give you an idea of um, where, where things fall. Um, Charlie, John, if you'd like to add any comments about how we came up with the program or any thoughts about what we've discussed, I'd like to turn it back over. Um, mainly, our reason for going with the Virginia minimum wage, like Mr. Donahue said, is if we went with the federal minimum wage, it would have been around, what was it, $12.62 an hour and $14. When you factor in insurance, obligations for the employee 
that's not a wage that anyone could live off of. So we wanted to have a twofold impact, um, which weighed in on our decision to go with the Virginia minimum wage um, versus the federal minimum wage. Um, any questions at this time, I guess we can just open it up to the board for discussion. Is this a one-time thing or is it gonna be continued? So when you say one time, explain what you mean by- It means that it's only for the new businesses or it's gonna continue once they get established in the city. For the new business once they- Okay. That's right. So the, the grant was envisioned as being a one-time payout, um, which would occur at the end of year one. Uh, based on the verification of those jobs being created and maintained for that initial year, uh, which is your baseline here. Um, so at the end of year one, it would be a one-time payout pay based on your performance. And, uh, year. and we did play with the idea of doing it for multiple years, up to five years, but it ended up being too great of a financial obligation for the board considering our finances that we currently have. And, and really, this was envisioned um, as an opportunity for the board to kind of sweeten the pie for a business considering uh, locating in Fort Smith. Obviously, there are uh, state programs available, um, but this just adds another layer to that um, and certainly encourages them to increase uh, their position and wage rates that they would be uh, offering here within the city to offset some of the added costs incurred by the company. Um, to Ms. Rogers Garner's point, you know, budget considerations, those are something that you know you want to look at uh, based on your uh, current assets and resources and um, you know, how uh, you would be implementing this program, that would be something you would need to look to uh, keep in consideration. It would be a discretionary program. Um, Again, you can look at you know, some of what the projected payouts might be for um, a company meeting the uh, maximum grant award allowed. Um, it could be a situation where you do fund multiple projects per year. You may want to look at limiting your commitment um, and the number of grants you award annually. Um, and certainly, this is uh, open for discussion of um, something you need to be aware of. Um, and we're looking for some guidance at staff's level to determine how we work to finalize the guidelines for the program. And um, from that point forward, we would look to obviously um, amend your budget as necessary uh, to incorporate the program, um, depending on what you'd like to set aside. And then we could proceed with uh, you know, developing program materials such as applications and agreements and so forth, and then look to launch that uh, program for you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the hard work and dedication you put in to um, coming up with a program um, that will benefit not only companies, but our citizens um, that, that want to get back to work and, and make some uh, decent money. So I think, uh, is there any other questions in regards to where we are at this point? So the next step then would be kind of having a discussion around the budget considerations and things of that nature. So would you still be um, spearheading that? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we look forward to further updates and discussions regarding the ad hoc committee on the PPIC incentive program. Thank you so much. Were you looking for additional feedback from the board today? Well, I would certainly, um, if the board would have any, any desires, I, I know you're missing Mr. Williams here this morning. Mm -hmm. um, any feedback you have as far as the budgetary considerations or um, any other thoughts you'd like to share today? Otherwise, um, if you'd like to uh, discuss amongst yourself offline, we can come back in uh, March with another meeting to finalize the program details for adoption at a later date, we can do that. Okay, first I'll acknowledge Mr. Parra, then Ms. McSwain. I think it's an excellent idea. 
uh, is there a cap on the number of businesses that we would supply this for? We would be making it specific, so it would be at our discretion. Um, Each one. Mm -hmm. I think the way to do that would be to allocate a set amount of funding per year, um, whatever your desire would be. Maybe cap that at you know, $100,000 annually. Um, and that would obviously be based on your abilities to funding program. I think that would be the way to, to limit the number of companies that could participate in the program. Is the state program limited in that way, or any businesses that meet the requirements receive funding? It, it is that second. Uh, it's, it's, so I think we just need to be clear when we say this that, you know, not every business who meets this, it would be it. Yeah. Absolutely. We just need to. So it was created based off of the state, pro state right. program loosely, but it won't yeah. be exactly yeah. like that. Mr. Swain, thank you. Is there any way that we can get a copy of this? I would like to just look over it. I mean, it Absolutely. sounds good off the surface. Of, I want to just, you know, you do it. We can email the presentation. Yes, to please. Colleagues. Thank you. And I think it'd be advantageous of us to kind of have the other three members engaged in the discussion as well. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, I impress a date come to the next meeting <coughs> so that we can move forward on this. Which is not still here. So you will email the presentation out to all members. We, we will. We will share that um, this morning. And um, again, any feedback, if you'd like to communicate that to the chair, vice chair, the yeah, applicant committee, uh, we can work to uh, incorporate it modifications, changes that you see. Thank you. I just want to say that I do appreciate Mr. Donahue and staff because we went back and forth at length about how to implement it and different visions of the program. So thank you guys for your hard work. Mr. Brock. Um, Mr. Donahue, do you have any numbers on how many businesses in Portsmouth take advantage of the state's programs? Uh, we could provide that. We do administer the Virginia Enterprise Zone program right. at the local level. So any um, applications for state funding would come through our office. Um, so we could check on that and, and give you kind of a historical uh, report on you know, last three to five years, what yeah. we've seen, who's taken advantage of it, in what way. Yeah. Uh, that's something that we're um, you know, involved in that process. So yes, yes sir. Any further discussion regarding the incentive program? <clears throat> All right, none. We move on to our board retreat. And the date set for our retreat will be March 28th. Um, I'd ask if you have any items for the retreat to be sent to myself and Vice Chair Rogers Gardner. Um, what would be a good drop date? in order for you to receive information so that we can kind of maneuver. If possible, if we could have that list of items by uh, next Tuesday, I believe that's March 1st, um, that would allow us sufficient time if we have to reach out to any uh, third parties to, to have them involved in the retreat or obtain any information uh, well enough in advance of the meeting. I will send out an email this afternoon to everyone just to reconfirm that if there are items you like listed for the board retreat that may not have already been submitted, that those items will be due by March 1st. I have a question. Do we have a time for the retreat? <laughs> Did you have an opportunity to speak with Ms. Um, Dr. Turner? Um, I believe she was available for the entire day. Um, Believe a morning um, nine, to 12, nine, nine to twelve window is available. Okay. If that works uh, for the commission schedule, okay. we'll look at it at nine to twelve on March twenty eighth. Thank you. Do business. Um. We do not have any new business, and there is uh, not a need for a closed session. So we are on to uh, items uh, submitted by commissioners. Okay. Any items to be submitted? 
Starring the report back. Okay. <laughs> I'll get you out of here on time today. Um, we do have a, uh, a few report backs. Um, uh, the first of which is um, Mr. Parr had requested an update on the Norfolk uh, Naval Shipyard and um, some of the prior discussions that we've had regarding surplus property there, um, specifically on the Burton's Point Road uh, corridor, which is uh, known commonly as the Southgate Annex. Um, the shipyard has had some staffing changes recently, um, and the longtime uh, representative, Doug Taylor, uh, retired uh, last year. Uh, his position has not been filled, uh, so his replacement is not uh, in place yet. Um, I did have a conversation with uh, somebody uh, with the Navy, and um, they had advised me as soon as that position is filled, uh, they would make that individual uh, available to us to provide an update. Um, so I would expect that to happen here probably in the spring. Uh, they are advertising the position now. Are there any questions on the uh, Norfolk Naval Ship there? Okay. Um, the next item was a um, request to uh, look into the Port Host Community Revitalization Fund. Um, program funding increase that was submitted to the General Assembly. Um, Delegate Scott uh, was the patron of a budget amendment um, that was uh, provided to the uh, General Assembly for consideration. Um, and that was to increase the annual uh, funding uh, for the program from 1.5 to $2.5 million annually. Um, for a total of $5 million over the biennial budget. Um, and that was submitted. Um, it's my understanding that it has uh, moved forward to um, the Senate and um, its other considerations, is my understanding of that. Okay. So we're very hopeful that there's an additional $1 million allocated for the program. We'll certainly work to keep you advised of the progress of the state. Um, as it relates to the, uh, the budget. Any questions? And that was the last report back item. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions, concerns? All right, then our next meeting is Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. This meeting is now adjourned.